This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. Welcome, everybody. It's a great joy to welcome you to this third annual Helen Edison Global Justice Lecture with Mary Robinson. I am Fauna Foreman. I co-direct the Center on Global Justice here at UC San Diego. We're a center dedicated to collaborative research across disciplines on the campus and in collaboration with communities and organizations to achieve more effective and sustainable results in bettering human life across the globe and right here locally in our own border region. Our affiliated faculty and researchers and graduate students have projects across the globe, as I said, including right here at home. The center also hosts high profile events, bringing the campus and the community, the public together like this one. Now, one thing I'd like to encourage our students to think about who are here tonight as they welcome this beloved global advocate for human rights, Mary Robinson, is to remember, to always remember, that human rights are not something that happens over there, right? something far away, you know, that violations are something that happens to nameless, faceless strangers on the other side of the planet. Um, while we aspire, obviously, to global solutions and ways of achieving global cooperation, we need to be mindful and to work for you know, the protection of human rights wherever they are threatened, even here at home, uh, in our own perhaps less exotic neighborhood. One of the distinctive features of UC San Diego for students who are interested in global development is that we sit virtually at the edge of a global laboratory. Um, the border that divides Tijuana from San Diego, Mexico from the United States, Latin America from you know, uh, North America, however you want to frame it, it's a, it's a border along many scales. Um, it's a zone of, of global conflict and deprivation that sits just 30 minutes south of our campus. 30 minutes south of San Diego's mega wealthy suburban paradise, you know, America's finest city. Um, and it's a microcosm, really, of all the conflicts and deprivations that an oil hungry globalization and development has wrought on the world's poor, intensified by a militarized you know, border that literally cuts across and radically disrupts the natural and social ecologies that situate and give meaning to so many lives in our region. The global is right here. Dear students, a slum of 85,000 people, just a few miles from where we are sitting at this very moment, where children go hungry and without medical care, where raw sewage and waste runs through the streams, polluting estuaries that are essential to environmental health in our region, where the rising temperature and less frequent rainfalls of climate change dry the terrain, creating dust vectors that fill people's lungs and make them sick, and so on. It's all right here, the last slum of Latin America heading north just a few miles from where we're sitting right now. Something to think about. So I'd like to introduce our guest tonight, Mary Robinson. She's truly a remarkable figure with a long and inspiring career and I'm deeply honored to welcome her to UC San Diego tonight. She was president of Ireland from 2002 to 2007, widely regarded as a transformative uh, figure there over her long career as a very young woman in the 1970s who first introduced family planning legislation, birth control into Catholic Ireland. So a brave young woman. Um, and also much later for transforming the Irish presidency into, far, into a far more active and progressive uh, office. Her commitment to global justice was apparent uh, to everybody uh, then uh, as she led Ireland to become a true global model 
a global leader for humanitarian aid and intervention. Afterwards, she took up her post as United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights until 2002, where she then became honorary president of Oxfam and formed Realizing Rights, the Ethical Globalization Initiative, whose core activities were, and this really sort of frames her, her own commitments personally uh, then and now, fostering equitable trade and decent work, promoting the right to health and more humane migration policies, working to strengthen women's leadership and encourage corporate responsibility. And the organization also supported capacity building and good governance in, de in developing countries. In 2010, she set up the Mary Robinson Foundation for Climate Justice that promotes thought, leadership, education, and advocacy on the struggles to secure global justice for the victims of climate change who are usually forgotten, the poor, the disempowered, and the marginalized across the world. This indeed is the subject of her talk tonight. Mary Robinson is also a member of the Elders, a group of world leaders who contribute their wisdom, their independent leadership and integrity to tackling some of the world's toughest problems with the goal of making the world a better place. This group of luminaries was founded by Nelson Mandela, Archbishop, Archbishop Desmond Tutu and others. I've been fascinated with Mary Robbins' work for as long as I can remember. I think I learned about her first in high school in a social studies course on reproductive health. She's a force of passionate conviction embodied in a package of elegance and grace. It's my deepest honor to welcome her here. Good evening, and thank you very much for that uh, warm welcome. I'm delighted to be invited to give the third Helen Edison uh, lecture and to do so under the auspices of the UCSD uh, Forum, uh, um, Global Justice uh, Forum, and indeed to be so warmly introduced by Fana Foreman. Uh, we had a very nice discussion this afternoon in the same building that I think some of you were present at when um, I was in a sort of dialogue uh, with Dr. Uh, Rama, Rama Hathan, um, or Ram as he allowed us to call him, um, and learned more about the Project Surya and uh, how it's one of the ways of trying to tackle uh, one of the issues. But uh, I'm also very pleased that there will be a forum tomorrow uh, which can take up some of the issues that we've been discussing, and I hope that I can uh, contribute some ideas in talking about my passion, I have to call it my passion now, uh, for uh, climate justice, which led me on my return to Ireland at the end of 2010 uh, to establish the Mary Robinson Foundation uh, Climate Justice. As Fana was talking about human rights, and I very much agree with the point she was making about the fact that human rights are very local as well as in different parts and different regions of the world, and I will be speaking mainly about issues in developing countries. But I was reminded of the famous quotation from Eleanor Roosevelt, which in fact I use at the very beginning of my memoir, um, which is available outside for those who would be interested. Uh, my memoir is called Everybody Matters. And I quote that passage from Eleanor Roosevelt, where she talks about where do human rights matter in small places close to home. And I said, I grew up in a small town in the west of Ireland. And when I first heard, heard that quote, it opened up a vision for me. But she makes the point that if human rights are to matter, it will take what she calls concerted citizen action. And that's as true now as when she spoke those words uh, many uh, years ago. And it is uh, centers for global justice and um, activity uh, such as the forum tomorrow that I think uh, make real uh, the commitment uh, to human rights. And it's very much from a human rights perspective that I began to understand and to learn more about the impacts um, of climate change and climate shocks on livelihoods in poor countries and communities. But maybe I should step back a little earlier to the work in uh, giving leadership in the United Nations for five years from 1997 to 2002 as UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. 
It was a big challenge. In fact, it was very difficult in the early stages because the Office of High Commissioner for Human Rights had been created after the World Conference in 1993 in Vienna. So it was a new office. There was one High Commissioner before me, and he resigned suddenly to become Foreign Minister of his country, Ecuador. Um, and I think it was true to say that the job was extremely difficult and he couldn't wait to get back to his own country and fulfil that important office. Um, and when I um, became High Commissioner, uh, Kofi Annan had just uh, put through the UN the first reform package, as it was called at the time, which gave the Office of High Commissioner a very central position in the executive committees that had been created on peacekeeping, on development, on humanitarian affairs, and on economic and social um, affairs. And this really brought home to me the range and breadth of human rights at the international level. Um, not just the rights that we place great emphasis on in industrialized parts of the world, very important rights to life, no torture, due process, independence of judges and courts, um, the rights to freedom of information, freedom of the press, freedom of association, but also, and very importantly, rights to food and safe water and health and education and shelter. And of course, there are the two key covenants on um, civil and political rights and on economic, social and cultural rights and conventions that uh, frame the uh, rights that uh, are uh, agreed to voluntarily by governments. But as Eleanor Roosevelt in that early quote said, governments sign up to these co covenants and conventions but don't necessarily implement them or don't implement them in full or sometimes slip back um, and um, are found to be in breach um, of their uh, commitments. And it takes the active interest and work of civil society um, in order to hold governments uh, to account, as well as the special rapporteurs and the committees and the high commissioners of the uh, United Nations. And I felt a certain a uh, sense of needing to uh, be more practical about economic and social rights after my five years serving as UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. I noticed at that time that the main human rights organizations very much focused on the civil and political rights. Amnesty International, we know the agenda of amnesty, um, uh, political prisoners, Guantanamo Bay type issues, no torture, etc. Very, very important. The agenda of Human Rights Watch, um, again, looking very much, especially at that time, um, at, at, at issues of civil and political rights. So I based myself in New York with um, a small number of colleagues to look at practical ways of implementing the other side of the uh, human rights agenda, the rights that are very, very important in developing countries and need to be framed and implemented as human rights, not as political aspirations. And as Fana had indicated briefly, we focused on certain areas. Um, we had our health team in the Aspen Institute in Washington, um, D.C., and that health team worked with a number of African governments to help to strengthen their health systems, but also with civil society in those countries to address issues of maternal and child health and reproductive health. And we worked on um, women, peace and security issues in conflict countries in Africa, and that took me um, to quite a number of countries. We worked on corporate responsibility. It was the time when there was a beginning to be the work of Professor John Ruggie and his team to draw up the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. A very important uh, way of ensuring that those with power would be held to account. Before that, um, it was felt that the international human rights system uh, put obligations on the states who signed up to the covenants and conventions. But under the patient work of Professor John Ruggie, which uh, Realising Rights very much supported, we managed to get the Human Rights Council to accept that corporations had a responsibility, not the same as governments. And the framework that Professor Ruggie uh, introduced and that was accepted by the Human Rights Council said that uh, governments had a duty to protect people from violations by their human, uh, of their human rights by corporations. And uh, that was the first time that had been clearly said, and that all corporations had a responsibility to respect human rights. And that the word respect wasn't just a passive do no harm, it was actually a due diligence requirement, and that there were, it was a need for better remedies. And 
Uh, subsequently, again, um, we supported this work. Um, uh, Professor R uh, John Ruggie uh, framed UN guiding principles, which the uh, Human Rights Council also accepted. And it was that kind of work we were also doing in a number of African countries because of the role and the power of corporations and, frankly, the violation of human rights by corporations in uh, a significant number of African countries. And we even worked on decent work issues in two African countries, in Liberia and Ghana, because work is a human right under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We sometimes forget that. We may sometimes talk about labor rights, but actually Article 23 of the Universal Declaration talks about the right to work, equal pay in work, and fair conditions in work. Way back in 1948, um, it was understood that work was actually essential uh, to uh, human dignity. And um, I felt that we needed to broaden a perception of human rights, that when you say the words human rights, even to an informed and intelligent and alert audience like this, people hear it differently. And for many people, the words human rights tend to be very sort of politicized and finger pointing. Whereas to me, the two key articles of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights are first of all, the first sentence of Article 1. Article 1 says, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. That's what human rights are about. It's a, a heritage for everybody since 1948, that we're all born free and equal in dignity and rights. But we know that that's not the reality for millions of people who don't know that they have rights or who live in such um, violent si situations of conflict and, and violence that they um, uh, cannot uh, feel protected or secure, or they live in abject poverty which can be a denial of human rights. And the second article that I don't think we've emphasized enough, those of us who are very committed to human rights, is Article 29, the second last article, which says that everyone has duties to the community without which you don't reach the full expression of your personality. And I love to tease out the implications of that because it's not a kind of liberal Western concept, um, even though sometimes as High Commissioner, and countries in Asia, for example, would say to me, your rights are Western rights. And I would say, well, is this a Western concept that everyone has duties to the community without which you do not reach the full expression of your personality? It means you have to know that you have duties to the community and do something about it. So who is the community here in the region of San Diego? Um, who is the community um, at, in this place that is so near a border with others, in a place where there are such um, contrast between great riches and great poverty. Um, it's, it's, it's a very interesting thing to think about and it's very relevant, I think, to the work of the Center for Global Justice. Anyway, between these issues of health, right to health, women, peace and security, corporate responsibility, and the work we were doing on uh, trade issues and decent work, um, I was actually traveling from a, for the period from 2002 until 2010 in a number of different African countries. As Fona referenced, I was also Honorary President of Oxfam, and that took me um, to other places. And um, I began to hear a refrain um, uh, about um, 2004, I would say, maybe uh, early 2005. I began to hear in different contexts the same kind of sentence, which I kind of now call the ah, but sentence, ah, but things are so much worse. And it was about the impacts of climate shocks, of weather shocks. Uh, but we used to have seasons when I was growing up, my friend Constance O'Kellett of Uganda uh, told me. And we had enough food. We were poor, but we had food because the farmers knew when to sow and when to harvest. And of course, most of the farmers like her were women. So they knew exactly um, how to bring food to the table. But at about that time and since then, the climate has completely changed in that part of northern Uganda. And it is long periods of drought followed by flash flooding, and then drought again and flash flooding. The school was destroyed, which is how Constance became a leader in her community with a group of women to try and hold their community together. And then Oxfam found her and she was um, encouraged to become one of the wise women to talk about the reality of climate in her village. And uh, she used an expression which I've heard in a lot of contexts in, in Africa, we thought that God was punishing us. We thought that God was punishing us. And then she learned more and learned about greenhouse gas emissions and 
climate change uh, impacts that were caused by human activity, by fossil fuel um, um, uh, use. And she puts it a different way. She says it's the lifestyles of rich people that have caused um, this deterioration in the poor livelihoods of her community and others. And that is why the word justice kept going through my head at that time. How come that it's the poorest communities that are suffering most because they are vulnerable? And of course, it's not all directly climate change. It's also deforestation, the fact that uh, people cook on firewood or animal dung or coal, and so um, the, 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 uh, the firewood is a, an asset, and um, uh, trees are stripped um, for, the, uh, for the firewood, and also bad soil management. But on top of fairly vulnerable climates, it can have a very devastating effect. And uh, in countries where there were predictable rainy seasons, the rainy season no longer came when it should. Um, I was going to Liberia quite a bit, and I would meet with Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, who's a very good uh, friend. And um, she was trying to cope at the level of her whole economy with the negative impacts of not being able to predict the rainy seasons. She wasn't able to predict when she should mend her roads. Um, it had huge impacts and, and continues to have, because the rainy season comes late, stays a shorter time or a longer time, but the worst thing is that it's not um, predictable. And of course, these are impacts on um, the livelihoods of people who don't have insurance, who don't have a kind of plan B, don't have a federal program to kick in uh, to protect them, and are very devastated. And I've seen this over and over again, the uh, impact that climate change has on people's lives. Perhaps the most telling impact was one that had a particular effect on me because I had a history with the particular country, and that is Somalia. Um, I had been the first head of state to go to Somalia at the request of Irish aid agencies in 1992 because there was fighting between warlords that was preventing food getting to feeding stations during a period of acute shortage and uh, famine in some parts. And the, the scenes in 1992 were very devastating. I remember being very affected by it and talking to both warlords, in fact. Fast forward to July 2011, those same Irish aid agencies came to me now in Dublin with my foundation on climate justice and said, the situation in Somalia is desperate. Will you come back again and help us to try to highlight it? And the truth is the situation at that time was worse than in 1992. First of all, um, the uh, conflict was largely as a result of um, al-Shabaab, um, a vicious group um, somewhat aligned to al-Qaeda. Um, the uh, fa uh, drought and famine situation was happening in July um, in 1992. Um, whereas it was in October, sorry, it was happening in October in 1992 at the end of the, of the dry season, but it was happening in July and there was going to be further um, period of drought and um, that there was the effects in July um, 2011. But something that I, I never even thought about when I was there in 1992, it never entered my consciousness, was the fact that in 2011, the Horn of Africa had had the eight hottest years in succession ever measured. So the impact was very, very striking, not just in Somalia itself. I was also in northern Kenya, where pastoralists were being devastated because they had to go so much further for much harder fodder to get for their animals. And uh, they, they were stressed women. Um, interestingly, another dimension of um, the uh, issues that we need to bring together, um, I decided on this particular visit in July 2011 that um, in talking to exhausted women with sick and exhausted children um, by their side, often lying down because they hadn't the strength to sit up, I would ask the women a question that I knew any woman would be able to answer, and it wasn't a pressure. So sometimes through translation, sometimes they understood um, English, I asked how many children they had. And I don't recall one single woman saying to me that she had less than six. Um, because of the fact that you needed to have six or seven, maybe, in order that one or two might live in that kind of situation. But it's also an indication of a population development because of the lack of education for girls and women, because of the lack of health systems that function to keep uh, maternal and health, um, uh, um, um, reduce maternal and, 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 and child deaths, 
and because of the absence of uh, contraceptive uh, devices or any um, education about uh, reproductive health. So uh, on top of the uh, climate impacts that are undermining the ability to grow and harvest and provide food, there's also um, a very dramatic population increase. Um, some of you this afternoon heard me uh, mention the figures um, for Malawi when I was there in January. I think they're worth repeating because they do, they do bring home the scale of what we're talking about. I was in Malawi at the invitation of the other woman president in Africa, President Joyce Banda, who's also a good friend. She um, is a member of the Council of Women World, okay, the Global Leaders Council on Reproductive Health, which I chaired um, at the time. And five of us came from outside to join with her to focus on her um, initiative for safe motherhood as president. She had a presidential initiative um, for safe um, motherhood. And therefore, we were looking at the health statistics and at the population figures, especially for maternal and child uh, deaths and how th that was being improved. And the figures that stayed with me uh, were figures that I could sort of identify with because in the 1960s, the population of Malawi was the same as the population at the time of my country, uh, the Republic of Ireland. It was a population of three million, more or less. Um, by uh, the time I was there earlier this year, in January, the population of Malawi was 15 million. The population of the Republic of Ireland had gone up to about 4.7 million. But much more striking were the figures that both the World Bank and the UNDP were calculating based on the fact that the family size is 5.7 children average. And um, the predictions of very young marriage and um, even um, early pregnancy, um, on those current trends, the population of Malawi would be 50 million by 2050 and 120 million by the end of the century. And this is a poor agricultural country that's already suffering from both extreme flooding in one part of the country and extreme drought, much more than before in the other part, and therefore already having problems of food security. These are the realities when we talk about what is happening in our world. Um, and the injustice is that Malawi, as a poor agricultural country, is not using fossil fuel um, to any significant extent, is not contributing. Indeed, I learned at a conference on climate in Rwanda in 2004, I learned that at the time, um, the whole of the continent of Africa was contributing less than 4% of greenhouse gas emissions. Even if it's gone up a little bit since then, which I don't really think it necessarily has, I'd say it's still less than 5%. And yet, the impacts are very severe. They're very severe in other poor communities as well, in South Asia, in small island states, etc. But my knowledge and uh, reference points are um, countries and quite a significant n number of countries um, in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, in West Africa, in East Africa, in Northern Africa. And the story is more or less the same. It's more severe in some places than others, but it really is hurting. And what was I thinking about this? That climate was undermining these important human rights that I was particularly focusing on, rights to food and safe water, health, education, shelter and that um, it wasn't possible to prove exact causation to an entity or a country, um, but nonetheless, it was happening. And the United Nations Human Rights Council began to pay attention to this reality. In fact, it was the Maldives, uh, because the Maldive Islands are potentially going to go underwater completely uh, because of sea level rise, uh, because of climate change. The Maldives, brought the issue of human rights um, to the, of the climate change to the Human Rights Council. And there have been a, a succession of resolutions now of the Human Rights Council that um, note that climate change is having very negative impacts, very adverse impacts on um, a whole range of human rights, and um, including the right to life itself and um, the predictions of huge migration. There are estimates that there could be as many as 200 million climate displaced people by 2050. There is no climate convention for refugees that are climate refugees, and they're not included in the refugee convention. So work is beginning now to say, how can we manage to, to cope with this? So all of these issues brought me to um, a realization that it was necessary to somehow 
bring this together in its complexity, bring together human rights, development, the negative impacts of climate, and also the positive things we needed to do about it. And all of that is encapsulated in the idea of um, climate uh, justice. And the foundation which I established is therefore a thought leadership. Um, um, it, it focuses on being a center for thought leadership, for education, and for advocacy on the struggle to secure global justice for those people who are vulnerable to the impacts of climate change, who are usually uh, forgotten and who are disempowered, but who have a right to low carbon development. So um, let me outline the three areas that we were um, engaged in um, in my foundation and then spend a little bit of time on a big uh, uh, issue of uh, trying to create a movement to create awareness of this, a, 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 um, a climate justice dialogue, um, which we're engaged in uh, with the World Resources Institute, and which has been initi initiated just in the last uh, few uh, weeks. Um, in my foundation, we wanted to focus on practical ways to address um, the uh, way in which climate was undermining uh, the uh, poor livelihoods. And very early on, we realized that this had a huge gender dimension. It didn't have the same impact at local level on uh, men and on women, uh, because uh, it was women who would have to uh, struggle more to put food on the table, go further to get the water in times of drought, um, uh, have to cope with um, flooding and uh, the destruction of crops, because um, about 80% of the farmers in Africa are women. So women uh, farm and then cook the food, produce it to the table, and collect the firewood and the water, etc. And all of this was aggravated uh, by climate change. So in response to that, we adopted a twofold approach to women's leadership on gender and climate change, a sort of top-down and a bottom-up. And we encouraged a network of grassroots women's organizations, and we link with other organizations like the Green Belt uh, movement of Wangari Mathai and many other groups at local level. And we have a uh, troika plus of women leaders um, on gender and climate change. And the troika word is actually a word that is very difficult now in Ireland, because we have a troika, um, which is in, uh, ensuring that Ireland uh, complies with the uh, difficult financial uh, austerity measures we've had to take because of the financial crisis. And the troika is um, the um, IMF, the um, European Central Bank, and the European Union. So nobody likes the word troika. But unfortunately, I had already used the word troika for um, this uh, group of women leaders because it's built on the three women who presided over conferences on climate in Copenhagen, Connie Hedegaard, who's currently the uh, European Commissioner for Climate Action, and then in Mexico, the then Foreign Minister, Patricia Espinoza, and in South Africa, uh, the then uh, the Minister for International Cooperation, uh, Mighty Mashaban. And those three women agreed to form this Troika Plus, and um, the um, Executive Director of UN Women, Michelle Bachelet, joined, and the head of um, UNDP, Helen Clark, became a member. So we had over 60 ministers, mainly of environment and of energy, but also about half a dozen of whom uh, were men who were very supportive. We kind of kept men in their place on the um, Troika Plus, but we didn't want to exclude them either. And this Troika Plus of women leaders worked last year to get a, um, the principle of gender balance into the climate conference in Doha. And we succeeded in the end in a way that um, people are actually calling the Doha miracle, because um, we got 193 countries to agree to this principle of gender balance in the delegations going to the climate conference and in the bodies um, like the Green Climate Fund and the Technical Committee, et cetera, of the UNFCCC. I think it'll take a little while and a little pushing to get the actual 50-50 gender balance, but it does um, underline the importance of addressing the gender dimensions and the importance of women's empowerment um, to cope with the effects of climate change. We then looked at another issue, which is the one we were discussing um, earlier this afternoon um, on energy and the importance of Project Surya, and um, that is how to ensure that the poorest 
have access to affordable clean energy as a way of adapting to the stresses of the climate shocks that they are experiencing. And this brought home to me, I think for the first time really, just how unequal our world is when you look at the uh, lack of access to electricity. It will be one of the issues that will be discussed in the forum here tomorrow. And I hope that some bright young students will have some good ideas about how to scale up access to affordable electricity because at least 1.3 billion people in our world today don't have any access to electricity. That's 1.3 billion out of 7 billion. But the figure for cooking on open fires um, with wood or coal or animal dung is even greater. It's um, uh, the figure that um, I've been using that I think many people use is 2.6 billion out of that 7 billion. That's a very, very significant proportion. And it also results in huge health problems, um, uh, where um, uh, somewhere between three and a half and four million people a year, according to the Lancet Medical Journal, die from indoor fumes. And of course, the vast majority are women, or even children who are close to their mothers um, while, they're, while they're cooking. And uh, we do have now um, the clean, uh, cookstoves, different types of cookstoves in different parts um, of the world. And I serve on the leadership council of the um, Green, the um, Alliance, UN Alliance for Clean Cookstoves, which Secretary of State Hillary Clinton was very supportive of as, uh, in her, her capacity as um, US um, Secretary of State. And recently, the uh, Alliance for Clean Cookstoves uh, set itself an ambitious goal, that um, the goal was to reach that 100 million households would have clean cooking by 2020. And that sounds very ambitious, and in a way it is, except when you set it against 2.6 billion people, it's not. If that's all we can do by 2020, when will we reach the 2.6 billion, when we're only talking about 100 million? So we have to find ways to scale up very dramatically by millions, not um, uh, by 100,000 here and 20 villages there, but much more dramatically. So um, about 18 months ago, my foundation brought together two expert groups who didn't mix before, who'd never really interacted. One were the energy providers, those who provide energy gadgets, clean energy gadgets, clean cook stoves, lights, etc. And the other was those who work at um, a, a serious management level in social protection systems in poor countries. So we brought together experts from Brazil, from Mexico, from India. And it was a very, very important conversation because neither side had ever really thought about the other. Um, in the social protection systems, there were cash vouchers for women to keep their children in school, or school meals, or some supports for productive work, maybe a goat or some chickens, or maybe even a cash voucher. But the poor, if they get cash vouchers, have so many things that are more a priority than energy, um, like food or um, school fees or medicines for a dying child. And so they don't spend the money on energy, even if they get cash vouchers. But they spend a lot of money on energy but it's kerosene and candles for lighting. And then it's um, the, the, the problem of um, despoiling uh, trees and landscape um, for the, um, uh, to uh, use the, um, the heating, the open fires. So um, uh, we've now gone to the World Bank with this idea, and the World Bank are um, looking, they've set up a working group to perhaps pilot the idea of using the large schemes in countries, for example, in Ethiopia, in the social safety net, uh, so productive social safety net scheme, there are um, between seven and a half and eight million who are very well known and could be part of a catchment for clean energy gadgets. And in South Africa, there's more than 15 million. In Brazil um, the, the, and in parts of India, the numbers would also be very big. It would be possible um, to uh, scale up very dramatically. And it's that kind of thinking of solutions to uh, change the circumstances positively of those who are negatively affected by climate that's very much part of climate justice. It's not just drawing attention to how serious the situation is, it's what do we do about it. That's the justice. And um, there's another justice that I'll um, come back to um, uh, shortly. The third thing that we realized, and I've already emphasized it, is that 
the impacts of climate, the shocks, um, are causing food insecurity and nutrition insecurity. And this is in a context where there is already um, a huge inequality and huge problem about food. In fact, yesterday I was in Ontario taking part in a forum on food security organized by the University of California. And it had various components of, the, of UC coming together in a major forum on food and nutrition security. And we were looking at the inequalities. Um, the inequalities are inequalities uh, in that almost a billion people are hungry every day and children are stunted because they don't have enough food, they have malnutrition or undernutrition, and stunted children, as I think you know, um, uh, will never re reach their full intellectual and physical potential. Um, they can never, it can never be reversed if they um, suffer from severe malnutrition and become stunted. So it's, a, it's a, such a, um, a terrible thing, and it's, it's terrible to see in very poor countries now with uh, bad food security, stunted children um, in villages, in slums, um, and to know that they have already been deprived of their full human rights, if I could put it um, um, that way. And um, also in rich countries, as you know, we also have uh, families on food stamps. We have children who are hungry. Um, the inequalities are um, not just um, in the very poorest countries. But um, because of a crisis in 2007 and 2008 of um, very high f uh, food prices, uh, partly caused by uh, biofuels, corn and other um, food crops being used for biofuels, and that aggravated the situation, um, it was realized that uh, poor countries were not being supported and encouraged in their food production, and it had slipped the development agenda. There'd been a lot of focus on health, a lot of focus on education, and not enough focus on food production. So there has been, it's good to say, much more um, emphasis now on the vital importance of uh, food and nutrition security. Not just food, because you need the nutrition, you need the quality um, of food, not just the bulk um, of uh, food that doesn't have good nutritional quality. And I learned a lot from the excellent uh, forum yesterday. But the challenge of the forum yesterday was how do we feed 8 billion people by 2025 in a way that is ecologically healthy and um, doesn't uh, deplete um, the, the, the resources of the ecosystems of the, of the world. And there weren't any easy answers. It was a big, big challenge um, to that forum as it is. Um, my foundation uh, takes the perspective of the very poorest and uh, poorest countries and communities in looking at their food um, uh, security and their access to uh, water as part of that food and nutrition security. And I'm glad to say that actually next week in Dublin, when I return to Dublin um, at the weekend, on Monday and Tuesday next, the 40, 15th and 16th of April, there will be an EU presidency conference in Dublin on hunger, nutrition, climate justice. And I'm, I love that title because commissioners will come from other countries of the EU and that's what they will be talking about. But even more than that, we have framed this conference to be a listening conference to those who actually know the problem and in many cases know what works in providing food and nutrition at local level. And that is smallholder farmers, indigenous people. We have uh, 97 participants from different parts of the world, as far away as the Arctic and uh, Mongolia, and different parts of Africa, South Asia, Latin America, coming to share their experiences and actually share South-South practice of how to cope with the impacts of climate and um, ensure food security. And I think we will uh, learn quite a lot and learn messaging uh, from that. So these were the areas that we were working on. We were working on, as I said, the gender dimensions of climate change, um, how to get energy to the very poorest that's affordable because they have a right to develop and uh, the more that they can develop with clean energy the better for the world the better for them and thirdly um, food and nutrition security but what was really bothering me and my colleagues was the lack of a political urgency uh, the lack of a sense that we have to get together on this in a very urgent way and I figured out that uh, we're not urgent about climate change because we don't see it as about people. 
We see it as being about science, which sadly in this country is very contested at times because there's a lot of money going into trying to confuse and contest and muddy the water about science, um, money um, of the fossil fuel uh, lobbies. And it's, it's somehow about melting glaciers or uh, two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial standards and people switch off and they don't really get engaged. But, you know, the warning signs are incredible now. Uh, the World Bank had a report recently, which I'm sure a number of you have read, called Turn Down the Heat. What a four degrees Celsius world, uh, four degrees above pre-industrial standards would be like. And it's catastrophic. It's unlivable. Um, and uh, we are not on course for what government said um, is necessary for a safe world. And I was emphasizing this afternoon, and I emphasize it here as well, particularly for the students um, for whom this is much more of a reality than for somebody who's an elder like me. By the way, um, I, I thought that uh, Fauna might mention, I'm not just an elder, I'm one of the younger elders. You know, <laughs> come on. <laughs> but it is a privilege to be in that group chaired by Archbishop Des Desmond Tutu. But in fact, it is young people who should be alarmed that we're not taking more seriously and urgently the political issues relating to what needs to be done. And we should be very focused on the next couple of years. It's a unique moment in time, from now until the end of 2015, because there are global agendas that should be implemented by the end of 2015. But we need a lot of political commitment to do that and a lot of willingness to take hard decisions and indeed to compromise to some extent on um, uh, what would be uh, selfish um, growth issues in order to get sustainable futures. The two agendas which come to a kind of fruition at the end of 2015 or indeed are planned to come to are first of all the commitment that governments have made to have a new climate agreement and that includes the United States, China, they've all agreed. They agreed at the um, conference on climate in Durban, South Africa in 2011, and they repeated it in Doha last December that there needs to be a climate agreement. And they have agreed that um, the world needs to stay below two degrees um, Celsius above pre-industrial standards. And that agreement, therefore, should set out the parameters of how we reach that and should do it with equity and fairness. And then the second agenda has the same kind of timescale. Um, we're coming to the end of the period of the UN Millennium Development Goals. They were um, uh, to be uh, between 2000 and the end of 2015, and the goals were to be reached. A number of the goals have been uh, reached overall um, in some ways, though not in individual countries. Most of the uh, countries of conflict will not have reached the Millennium Development Goals and um, um, many African countries may reach some but not all of the uh, goals. But um, there is now a review in September in the General Assembly, an assessment of where we are in 2013 and a kind of push for a more robust um, implementation by particularly the poorest countries of um, these goals on health, on education, on gender equality and so on. Um, and Meanwhile, there's a working group in the United Nations now working on the next step for the world, which was committed to at the Rio conference in June last year, Rio plus 20. And that is that all countries will commit to sustainable development goals. But we won't know what those sustainable development goals might be unless we have parameters of sustainability, unless we have a climate agreement that sets out, yes, we are going to stay within the two degrees Celsius, and this is what this means for the richer countries and for all emerging econ economies like the Chinas and Indias and Brazils and for the poor countries because everybody will have to make efforts to mitigate emissions, to reduce them and to have adaptation, etc. Now, um, do you think that this is an agenda that everybody's talking about in political circles? No, I haven't heard it. Um, it's not really um, you know, a concerted agenda. Indeed, there is some effort at the UN level to keep the two agendas separate, um, to just talk about sustainable development goals without talking about climate, because climate can be uh, political and contested and difficult. But in fact, we can't really do one without the other. So this is why uh, the World Resources Institute 
came to the same conclusion as my small foundation. We were coming at climate from a people-centered perspective, and we saw the urgency at, of having um, political commitment to achieve the two uh, global goals by the end of 2015. Uh, w the World Resources Institute in Washington, D.C., which a number of you will know the work of, is very uh, science-based, um, uh, evidence-based, produces very good reports on climate issues, on resources issues, uh, flagship reports. And they came to the same conclusion that we did, that we have to change the whole story about climate. We have to talk about it in a different way. We have to feel about it in a different way. We have to get passionately committed to it. And like us, they think that climate justice is a way of doing it by having a people-centered approach, by getting the evangelical movement in this country to talk about climate in a completely different way and to realize the impact it's having on the poorest people um, in areas where the evangelical movement has been quite active to help people in health and education. But climate is undermining it and they have to change the mindset and understand um, what is going on. So we have launched a climate justice dialogue in order to uh, uh, galvanize um, energies um, for political commitment and to bring home um, through what we're calling kind of constituencies of demand in every country um, for the leaders of that country to take seriously their appropriate responsibility to ensure that we get a, good, a new climate agreement and that we get uh, sustainable development goals that are seriously going to keep us on track for a safe world. And the last thing I'll say, because I'd love to hear your views at this stage um, on some of these issues, um, the last thing I'll say is that it, it's very much in my mind that there is an injustice about where the impacts of climate are hurting already and those least responsible. So the justice dimensions are very clear. But there's another kind of justice that we have to think about more and more, and that is intergenerational justice. This is the first time in human history that we have to take decisions now because of the impacts that are going to take effect on our children and grandchildren if we don't take decisions now. We're running out of time, in fact. And earlier this afternoon, I was saying what I'll, what I'll repeat here, um, that um, I do quite often now uh, talk about this in very personal terms because I feel very personal and very passionate um, and very committed to uh, doing what I can because of that intergenerational justice as well. Um, uh, I have four beloved grandchildren. I'm a real Irish granny. Two of those grandchildren live in Dublin and two live in Barcelona. They were with us at Easter, all four of them. And when I look at them, I think of the world that they will have when they're in their 40s. It will be 2050, and they will share that world with nine billion others. And I do worry about what they will say about us. What will they say about what we did or failed to do? Especially in the coming up to 2015, because I've no doubt that historians will be talking about 2015, the big year of the start of Sustainable Development Goals, the big year when c countries had committed to a climate agreement. If we miss those, or if we don't fulfill them in a meaningful way, if they're paper but not actually dealing with the problem, then what will they say? I think I can hear the echoes of what they will say. I think they will be extraordinarily frustrated and angry and stressed and worried because of the climate shocks that would be so much more severe, the displacement of people that would be so much more severe, the islands that will have gone under um, because um, of the failure to counter the impacts of climate change. And that's something that I think we need to think about, that intergenerational justice. Maybe it's something that women think about more. We talk a lot about our children and our grandchildren, and maybe it's easier for us to think in terms. But I certainly find that it's a way of bringing 2050 a lot closer. It's only 37 years away. It's not that far away. And yet those who talk about climate talk in terms of it being a really key period um, where if we have not taken the steps we should have, then the results can be uh, very worrying. And I'm not trying to engender a mood of doom and gloom and send you all home um, to have a sleepless night. Far from it. The very reason that I'm talking in these terms is because there are so many things we can do. 
and I've mentioned a number of them. And indeed, um, the project um, Surya is a good example of a very practical thing that, can, that is being done in this university. And tomorrow you'll have a forum where you'll be able to talk about uh, um, trying to scale up access to affordable energy. I think another thing that students can do is to put pressure on those who invest in fossil fuel. Um, that is what is causing the problem. We need to move from it. And it, it, there are a number of universities now who have very active movements to disinvest. And I can see the logic of that. And I think if I was a student now, I'd be very active in that kind of activity. Because we have to bring some kind of pressure to bear to highlight the importance of this issue, to get it onto the front burner of politicians. And believe me, I've been there. Politicians listen when suddenly constituents start writing to them, tweeting them, um, uh, talking about these issues in terms of, we need urgent action. So um, uh, you've been a great audience to uh, talk to. There probably are a few of you who don't agree at all with what I'm saying, and I'd be happy uh, to hear from you if that is the case. But I think um, uh, this is an issue that a university like this can really take on, especially with a Center for Global Justice and the scientific um, uh, um, expertise that you have. So over to you. I'd love to hear your comments or your uh, questions. And thank you for being such a good audience. Thank you very much. <laughs>